There is a feeling, I think, that in the past, um, US administrations have moved in and made a lot of promises, and then the administration changes, and then you get a very different sort of thing. So to go back to China, part of China's appeal is that at least since 2006, its interest seems to have been very consistent, and its presence has been fairly consistent. So in areas of concern to the Pacific, such as access to US labour markets, such as climate change, there needs to be more listening on the part of US policymakers and US business to what the, uh, what the genuine needs of the Pacific are. Otherwise, you know, you can talk about it being America's backyard or whatever, but if you're not paying attention to your backyard, then you know, why should they care about you? In what ways is China's influence in the Pacific Islands most apparent? It really depends which Pacific Islands you're talking about. But if you were to generalize across the whole Pacific, you would say their influence was most apparent in terms of elites. And in many cases, you could refer to it as elite capture, but certainly their influence among the political and economic elites in Pacific countries is much stronger than their influence among uh, ordinary people. Some countries, they have a great deal more influence, and often this comes down to economic factors, like how trade-dependent the country is on China, and it varies enormously across the Pacific. So, for example, in the Solomon Islands, uh, more than two-thirds of their exports to China. So other than North Korea, they're just about the most dependent on China of, of any nation on the planet. Then you get to Fiji, which has moved slightly away from China in recent months. And in some ways, that's not a mystery because China doesn't even make the top four of their trading partners. Its main export is Fiji water to the US, oddly enough. So, uh, so thank you, Hollywood, for that. What makes China an attractive partner for the Pacific Islands? So in terms of what their attraction is, again, there's a real divide between the elites and the grassroots. So for the elites, I'll, I'll tell one story that maybe illustrates it best. This was in Papua New Guinea about 15 years ago. And there was a, a politician who was keen to get a project up and running with a Chinese partner. So it was a China Exim Bank loan. He already had money from the World Bank to do this project, and yet he switched halfway to take the Exim Bank loan, even though the interest rate was less favourable and it seemed to be not as good a deal overall. And I said, look, why did you go with China? And he didn't hesitate and just turned to me and said, because they're quick. And that was it. It was essentially they're quick, they're aid and their support comes with less strings than Western donors. And if you want stuff done, it can happen fast. And for political elites, that's very attractive. Amongst the community, they're not without appeal. Um, and again, there's some overlap there that they're building things and that they're building things that are visible has a real impact amongst much of the community. Yeah, they have a very love-hate relationship with the Chinese diaspora, but they view the companies that come in as real builders of the country. So when they build stadiums, when they build roads, uh, hospitals, this is really welcomed by the, uh, by the community at large. When they build big government office buildings, not so much. So yeah, there, there, there is some parallels, but essentially they're seen as doers and builders and people who do stuff quick and don't talk quite so much as the West. How do elite and popular opinions of China differ in the Pacific Islands? Yeah, again, really broad brush because um, there is a huge variation across the Pacific in terms of how China is viewed, both amongst elites and amongst the general people. I mean, from the extreme of Palau, where you have a country asking to have a US military base built there, um, and it seems to be out and out doing everything it can to annoy China, to the Solomon Islands with Sogavari um, appearing on national TV and declaring that he feels like he's home or back home, I should say. Uh, so huge variation. But within that, the elites, they, I think, appreciate the way the Chinese do business in many ways, at least up front. And they also really appreciate the red carpet treatment that they get when they go to Beijing. And this is something that doesn't cost China a great deal and that wins it a lot of political capital. And when you look at some of the metropolitan powers who are big in the Pacific, Australia, New Zealand and, and the US, it, it is something that they really fail to do. I mean, it's striking that in Australia, for example, we've had the leader of the US address our parliament. We've had Xi Jinping address our parliament. We yet to have a single Pacific leader address our parliament. And that 
is something that you think could be arranged very easily. We have, you know, statesmen of some stature. We have, for example, uh, Marape in Papua New Guinea. We have leaders um, such as Rambuka in Fiji who have the gravitas to, to do a really good oration in the parliament, and yet we don't invite them. For the general community, uh, the concern they have is that Chinese shopkeepers in particular are taking their jobs and are crowding out local businesses. So that would be the main uh, gripe that grassroots have throughout the Pacific. That said, these shops do provide, you know, basic everyday things and they're really, really cheap. So it's, it, it's again, a love-hate thing. Like they, they, they like the convenience of these shops, but they, they feel as though their jobs are, are being taken by these Chinese migrants. Why should Americans pay attention to relations between China and the Pacific Islands? Look, I think in many ways, even the framing of that question is interesting because um, I think uh, America should be paying more attention to the Pacific full stop, regardless of what China is up to. Because what China is doing now in the Pacific, how sustainable it is, uh, is open to question. No one knows exactly what's going to happen under Xi Jinping's leadership. Uh, if they pivot away from the Pacific, does America then ignore the Pacific again? So the case is there to be made that, you know, America should accept the fact that half of its coast is on the Pacific. America certainly should be more integrated to the Pacific. And the problem is that America has various levers it can pull. The military presence has always been very strong. And Indo-PACOM, as it's now called, formerly PACOM, knows the Pacific really well, are deeply engaged and have a great historical memory of the place. But when you go to the business side of things, when you go to the political side of things in the US, uh, engagement is a lot more spotty. Post-Cold War, basically the perception is politically America moved out after Clinton declared that, uh, you know, victory was theirs. And on the business side, uh, investment from American companies is very tepid to, to at best, even though there are lots of opportunities in tourism, um, in um, telecommunications, and even in data call centres, you know, the Pacific would be a great place to, to base call centres out of because people are, are really friendly and they're, they're awake at a time that, uh, you know, a lot of other people are asleep. So why that sort of investment isn't going in is a bit of a mystery. The Pacific is a little bit high cost, like it's not a, it's not a cheap place to live or to invest. But, you know, there, there needs to be a broader engagement, I think, from the US that goes beyond the military. What can the United States do to be a better partner for the Pacific Islands? Yeah, so that is something I think you can generalize across. Obviously, the US is much more engaged in the Northern Pacific, the compact states. So these are the Micronesian states in, in the north of the Pacific that America has economic arrangements with. And for those countries, they are pretty well integrated to the US. You know, they can serve in the US military, they can access American social security. So they, in some ways, are very much uh, already part of the American sphere. But even in these countries and in the South Pacific more broadly, what people are looking for in terms of a good partner is someone who is reliable, who shows up year after year and is willing to listen to what the Pacific wants. And the Pacific's development needs and economic needs are real. And there is a feeling, I think, that in the past, um, US administrations have you know, moved in and made a lot of promises and then the administration changes and then you get a very different sort of uh, sort of thing. So part of, to go back to China, part of China's appeal is that at least since 2006, its interest seems to have been very consistent and its um, presence has been fairly consistent. So in areas of concern to the Pacific, such as access to US labour markets, uh, such as climate change. I think there needs to be more listening on the part of US policymakers and US business to what the uh, what the genuine needs of the Pacific are. Otherwise, you know, you can talk about it being America's backyard or whatever, but if you're not paying attention to your backyard, then, you know, why should they care about you? How can the United States and China cooperate to serve the needs of the Pacific Islands? So there's so much potential in this area and... You know, the US-China relationship in, in Chinese foreign policy is the, the paramount relationship. It is the one that, that gets the most attention. And the rest of us here in Australia and New Zealand and the Pacific more broadly have to accept that we, you know, we, we, we are peripheral concerns of the Chinese leadership. But there are so many um, areas of potential cooperation between the US and China, most notably 
the existential threat of climate change faced by Pacific nations. They are the most vulnerable to um, natural disasters. Vanuatu is the most vulnerable. Tonga, I think, is number three. Palau, I think, is about number four or number five in terms of the impact natural disasters are having on their countries. And since 1970, the, the frequency of these events has tripled. So, you know, you, you can't, I mean, of course, you can argue that climate change isn't responsible, but it is clear that these disasters are increasing in both frequency and severity. So in terms of doing something about climate change, in terms of cooperating on disaster relief, there is an enormous potential for, for the US and China to work together. That is one area where both sides seem to be in agreement on, so it's probably the easiest area of cooperation. There used to be deeper cooperation. I mean, China and the US even had a, a trilateral cooperation project in Timor-Leste. They didn't give it a lot of publicity, but this was only 10, 15 years ago. The time for that might not be right now, but it has happened in the past. And so, you know, we should always be attuned to the fact that, that political realities in China could change, and we should be ready uh, when that happens. But climate change is, is the most important. I mean, we're already at a situation in some Pacific countries where people are having to abandon their villages as a result of rising sea levels, as a result of increasing storm surges. So, you know, the threat is real and is something that, you know, the US and China need to work on together. Is the political climate ready for that yet? I'm not sure. Oddly, China's uh, climate change related aid in the Pacific has been fairly, not that spectacular. If anything, Japan has been the major um, player in that uh, in that area, but there's so much scope for the U.S. and China to uh, to work on this together. Uh, another area that doesn't get a lot of attention, but there is a real potential for working together to make both the U.S. and China look more credible in the Pacific, is to address issues of transnational crime and issues of environmental crime that are occurring in the resource sector in the Pacific, in particular in forestry and in fisheries. Tuna is something very much at the, uh, the focus of many US lawmakers' minds, but the overfishing in the Pacific and the Pacific not getting as big a return on its fisheries is something that both parties, I think, could do a great deal to address. Obviously, in the case of China, you have a problem, along with Taiwan, to, to be fair, where there is a lot of illegal and unregulated fishing going on. That is something that in order to be a credible player in the Pacific, the US and China really need to work on this because much of this crime happens out of the reach of the Chinese state. It's not that people in Beijing want to have a reputation as being irresponsible fishers, but it really damages their reputation in the region when basically fish are caught and not paid for. It's really something that annoys people in this country. And on the other side of the coin, if the US and China could work together on the disposal of munitions, oddly enough, left over from World War II. This is the American legacy that hurts America more than anything else. It flies completely under the radar, but if you spend a bit of time in, say, the Solomon Islands, it comes up pretty quickly. So if this is something they could work on together, that would really be, you know, an, an incredibly welcome development in the Pacific.